What is up and welcome in. This is a live episode of Inside Black and Gold. I am Jeff Nowak, your solo host for today. Steve is going to be on the radio in about 30 minutes. So you got you to tune in over to WWL to catch up with Steve. I wanted to get a live chat in here because we haven't done one in a while. And, you know, we went over a lot of mock draft stuff last last episode. So we don't have to do that this time. We went actually, no, we went over breakout players last episode. The mock draft was two episodes ago. So I don't want to go through mock drafts that we did today. I want to go through mock drafts that a lot of other people did. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to dive into a lot of Saints topics. And I also wanted to get into a mailbag. So the second and third segment of this podcast will be a live mailbag. So if you have comments, questions, whatever, make sure to get them in the feed and I'll get to as many as possible in the second or third segments. I don't know how many people is going to have interest in a mid-afternoon live stream. Uh, maybe people driving in their cars uh, shouldn't watch a YouTube video, but that's neither here nor there. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna get into it again. My name is Jeff Nowak and we are getting closer and closer and closer to the 2024 draft. And so what I like to do this time of year is stop answering the question myself and start looking at all the other answers that are out there in terms of who were the Saints going to pick at number 14. They have picks at 14, 45, and then they don't pick again until 150. So these seven round mock drafts aren't exactly as exciting this time of year as they might be in other years because we're only talking about two guys maximum unless you do a trade and mock draft trades are always crazy. But so what I do is I go to NFL Mock Draft Database. It's a great website. Um, you know, I've been using it for years. Guy just improves it every year. And it just collects mock drafts from everywhere. It's a perfect place to go for the thing I'm trying to do, which is I went through 40 individual mock drafts. And if you want to follow along with these, you can go check out the article on WWL.com that lists every single one. I went through them exhaustively. And why I do this is because I'm trying to figure out, okay, who are the most common picks at any particular draft slot, particularly for the Saints. And so what I found in this is I pulled down 40 different mock drafts and it became very clear <laughs> that there was one very specific favorite and it became clear from the first one to the 10th one to the 15th one. And that is Olu Fashanu, the offensive tackle, for Penn State. At this point, you know, going into this draft process, he might have been a name a lot of people didn't know. He's quickly becoming a household name for Saints fans who look at it and say, okay, need a left tackle. There's a left tackle. <laughs> Let's bring him in. And I think it is that simple for in a lot of these. He would not be my pick if my pick was on the table. So that would be Taliesse Fuanga, who was the second most mocked player to the Saints. He had seven selections out of these 40. Troy Fatanu was the third most selected. He was in five different mock drafts. But all in all, there were 34 tackle prospects taken out of these 40 mock drafts at number 14. So whoever you land on at number 14, it's pretty clear that there's a very, very wide-reaching idea that the Saints desperately need an offensive tackle in this draft. It's a situation that most teams would rather not be in because you want to be the team that has the ability to say, wow, Brock Bowers is still on the board. We'd love to go get him and not have to be like, well, if we do that, Derek Carr is going to get his head taken off because you're going to have a turnstile standing out at the tackle position. So I agree with that. What I don't agree with is necessarily the reasoning. And in going through a lot of these mock drafts, I went through the ex explanations for every single one. And at least in 80% of them that took Fashanu, you saw Trevor Penning's name mentioned. You say, hey, Trevor Penning isn't working out. We're going to replace him with this guy. Ready-made starter from day one. And, and that's what I would say for Fashanu. If I was making the argument for Olu Fashanu at number 14 for the Saints, it is that as a pure pass-protecting tackle prospect, I think he probably is the best of the bunch. Now, that's what you'd call a high floor pick. And, and the thing is, if you are looking at this and saying, we need someone who can start on day one, 
this is the guy. Olu Fashan is the guy. He might not even be on the board at number 14. We're all just spitballing, but in a lot of these mock drafts, he ends up there. And, you know, while teams don't have to do what the mock drafts say, and they almost never do, it does give you a good idea of how analysts and people who are observing the situation feel about, about what players would be there, what players will land where, and, and you go from there. But I do think it's missing a critical element here, which is the Saints aren't going to draft a guy because he's ready to start on day one. In order to do that, you would have to assume that, hey, they're giving up on Trevor Penning entirely because you're looking at a left tackle prospect and you're saying he might have a low ceiling, but we're going to draft him because we need him to start right away. And I get the logic, but when you look at how this team drafts, it's almost certainly not going to be that logic. Now, if you get to 14 and he's the best option and he does fit, he does fit what the Saints are trying to do with their prototypes, right? You're talking 6'6", 312 pounds, 34-inch arms. You're in a 5'11", 40-yard dash. He's got really good technique, but you would classify him as the weaker athlete on the spectrum in terms of what he's able to do in the run game. You know, what is his profile and how can he develop over time? I think your ceiling's a lot lower than a guy like Fuanga, who, again, another guy who might not be on the board at this point. So, a lot of your decisions won't necessarily matter in terms of why you're making them because the board's going to make a majority of them for you. If you end up getting to this spot with the ability to choose between those two guys, then you've already won because you're just going to go with the guy that you like the best. And I think that's what you're looking at here. And I do think that when you're looking at the Saints, you do need to understand that they're not bailing on Trevor Penning. So they're not going to make a draft pick with the with with that in mind they're not whether you think he can work out a tackle or not they're not bailing on trevor so that won't be the reason they make this pick i think people are taking too much time and paying too much attention to the left tackle position and not paying enough tack attention to the right tackle position in this draft people are looking at it and saying well he's the best left tackle prospect so i'm going with olu fashanu i'm looking at it and saying i guys i think the saints need a right tackle more than they need a left tackle because <laughs> I I uh, I think it's pretty bleak with Ryan Ramchek in terms of what your expectations are. And I don't think he's going to be able to get through a season, even if he is ready to play, even if he is able to get back and play this season, I don't expect him to be able to get through a season. So I need to have his backup in place. So that's why I gravitate more toward Fuwanga, who the only real drawback that I, feel, I see a lot of people say is he's a right tackle. He's a guy who you're going to sit at right tackle now, there are questions. You're not getting a perfect prospect at number 14. You know, over time, maybe you decide, hey, this guy is a guard, right? He could profile the guard. And it's tough. And you look at Andres Pete. You took him at, I think, 13 overall, which is the same range. You drafted him as a tackle. You kicked him into guard. He was a three-time pro bowler at guard. So it's not the end of the world if that's what ends up happening. Uh, but I do think that people, the reason people are landing on Fashanu is wrong. Like you can argue to me that he is the best option at that spot, but it should not be, hey, they're gonna they're not gonna trust Trevor Penning because I do think this team is gonna give him every opportunity <laughs> to play. And it might be a dumpster fire and you might have to change course. But I think that's what you're gonna see this season. Uh, moving on, I want to go through the top 30 visits that we know about, right? Just to tie off this segment. And you know, the funny thing about the top 30 visits is we get to draft day and we maybe know 10, 12, some teams a little bit more, some teams fewer. So you see, okay, this guy visited here, this guy visited here, they had a workout with him. In almost every case, you're going to have a top 30 visit devoted to a player that you're drafting. If you're taking a guy in the first round, the second round, <laughs> even in, you know, the third or fourth round, get to the fifth round. You want to have had visits with these guys. Right. If you look at the players that we knew about, not all of the top 30 visits from 2023, but just the players that we knew about for the Saints, you're talking Kendra Miller, Jake Hayner, and I believe I believe one more. Let me, uh, let me look. There is one I had. I had it in the top of my brain and I lost it. Oh, and Jordan Howden. So if you look at the top 30 visits from last year, only the ones we knew about, which is about nine of them. Kendra Miller, Jake Hayner, and Jordan Howden were on that list. So you talk about a team, hey, if you make nine draft picks and we know six of the players that you've had in for visits, there's a pretty good chance that one of these players, one or more of these players is on that list. So I do want to go through it because there's a good chance that of these names I mentioned, 
one or more of them gets drafted by the Saints. So the first one is Chop Robinson. Now, Chop is intriguing because I don't know if he necessarily fits the mold of what the Saints want to do at defensive end, or at least what they have done at defensive end. He's a little smaller. He's 6'3", 254. It doesn't sound small, but it is when you consider that the Saints will typically go for guys in the 270, 280 range at defensive end. And you can make the argument that the game has kind of passed them by in that regard. You know, some of these bigger body defensive ends are not able to track and tackle the mobile quarterbacks. And we've seen the Saints struggle with mobile quarterbacks. Maybe this is the time you look at that. I don't think that he's in play at 14, but I think he would be in play at 45. So if Chop gets to 45, I look at him, you know, Penn State, he was not particularly productive in college. So you you look, you, you kind of try to figure out, okay, what is the vision for this guy? Um, moving on to the next one, Keon Coleman. He's very intriguing to me because I've talked a lot about how I think the Saints need to add another big bodied wide receiver. Whether you do that through free agency or the draft, you can make an argument, but there just aren't that many NFL capable big wide receivers on the free agent market that you could really expect in terms of, I think they need veteran leadership and I would settle for a Hunter Renfro and drafting your bigger bodied guy. But I think Keon Coleman certainly would qualify. The only question for me with Keon is whether he's actually there at 45. I've seen him kind of vary a good bit in terms of what you might see for, for a draft slot. I've seen him go late first round. I've seen him go all the way in the third round. But you're talking about 6'3", 213 pounds. He had a 4'6", 140-yard dash, 38-inch vertical leap. He's not going to blow you away with athleticism, but he's going to he's going to be a guy that makes catches in the middle of the field, makes catches in traffic. He's a Louisiana guy, so if you want that in your uh, repertoire, go for it. Um, 108 catches, 656 yards, and 18 touchdowns over the last two seasons. And I think he would make a lot of sense. I do think you still need to add to that wide receiver room as much as you like Chris Olave, Rashid Sheed, A.T. Perry. And no one's going to complain about adding talent on a talent. I'm going to run through these next couple. You had Christian Mahogany. He's a guard from Boston College. Um, and, you know, I should have mentioned this at the top. I did write all these up. So, again, if you want to follow along, I am going in the same order I wrote the article in. So, if you go over to WWL.com, you'll be able to find a write-up of each of these players and some information about them. These are all reported from independent sources. Uh, you know, Mahogany, he's a he's an upside guy. He's a potential backup, in my opinion. He ran a 513 in the 40, 6'3", 314 pounds. I think he's probably a day two or day three guy. So I think this is kind of the range where not unlike Nick Saldaveri last year, if you are looking at those fifth round picks and they're burning a hole in your pocket and you're sitting there at the end of the third round and you're like, hey, you know, I I, I got a good look at Christian Mahogany. I, I like the name. I enjoy the I enjoy the wood and I'm going to go for it. I think he's a guy you could target in that range like you did Saldaveri last year. Um, the next guy on the list, Marshawn Neeland. And what makes Marshawn Nealand really interesting to me is, you know, you look at some of these visits and you say, okay, why are you bringing this guy in? In a lot of instances, it's because you didn't necessarily get a good enough look at him at the combine, at the senior bowl, right? And so I probably should have explained this at the top. You're talking about top 30 visits. So every, every team gets an opportunity to bring in 30 draft prospects for a private meeting and work out whatever you want to do. There's some confusion with the name top 30 visit because I think a lot of people look, read that as this is a guy they expect to go in the top 30. No, it could be literally anybody. It could be a guy you're looking at as a UDFA, but you just want to get a bigger, a better look at them. And so you bring them in and you can only do that so many times. There are limits on that. Um, now, so there are some exceptions, right? So if a, I think if a school was, is within 75 miles of the team, you can bypass that and a visit from that player would not count against your top 30 visit. It might be 50 miles either way. Tulane is really the only notable school that the saints would get visits from that you would get away with. So there's no reason not to meet with every single Tulane player who could be a potential target in the draft. So I would be very surprised. I know they met with Willie Fritz before he went out of town. They got some insight on these players. I'm sure they're going to have a visit from Michael Pratt, guys like Jaquan Jackson, um, but they're not going to be on these top 30 visit lists. There are a lot more players that they met with at the combine, whatever. The reason I bring that up is you brought in Marshawn Nealon for a visit. 
but you had all the data points you really needed. You saw him at the senior bowl. You saw him at the combine. I'm sure they met with him at one or both of those events. So why would you bring him in for a visit for a workout unless you were very, very serious about drafting him? And this is a guy that I would not be surprised if he's in play at number 45. Maybe he slips into the third and he's kind of like mahogany. You package together a couple picks and go get him. But if if Marshawn Nealon's name comes on the board at number 45, don't sit there saying, who? I can't believe they drafted this no-name guy out of Western Michigan uh, because they're here kind of showing you their interest, right? So I can I can hear the I can hear the criticism already. This is Peyton Turner all over again. Whatever. Obviously, Peyton Turner was a first, but he was a late first as opposed to kind of an early to mid-second. Um, but when you see a team scout a guy at the senior bowl, scout a guy at the combine. And then also bring him in for a visit. Uh, you know, they're they're trying to tell you something. And and he's an interesting guy. Again, he's 6'3, 267. So in that same chop Robinson range, 475 in the 40 yard dash. Yeah, he was productive this past season. He had 57 tackles, four and a half sacks, two forced fumbles. I think he can get out into coverage a little bit more than some of their other defensive ends. He's very athletic. You know, I'd liken him to Foskey. I think this would be a similar pick to an Isaiah Foskey from last year. Um, take that for what it is, but it is interesting. Continuing along, you have a familiar uniform there in Northern Iowa, and it's a defensive tackle, Christian Boyd. You know, we already know the Saints have some intel on Northern Iowa prospects because I'm sure they did their due diligence on Trevor Penning a couple years ago. He was also a Northern Iowa guy, so they probably have those numbers saved in their phones. You know, so a school that might not be on their radar is on their radar a little bit more. Um, you know, I think building up, beefing up the defensive tackle position is important. If you don't go with defensive tackle at 45, Steve Geller and myself both uh, picked Braden Fisk, the Florida State guy at 45. So I wouldn't be surprised if you do go defensive tackle at 45 and this guy comes off. But if you're looking at defensive tackle in the third or fourth round, he would make a lot of sense. Um, one more guy, and this is a guy whose name you might recognize because I've talked about him before, is Dylan Lobby. Uh, he is a running back out of New Hampshire. I know. It seems weird. But there's a lot of potential there. And I was very impressed at the Senior Bowl with what he was able to do. Now, he's never going to be a bell cow, a between-the-tackles guy who can knock people back. But he does remind me of a James White, of a Danny Woodhead, Basically, if this was five years ago and Tom Brady was on the Patriots, you, the Patriots would 100% draft this guy. Now, that's a good thing, right? You know, you think of guys like Rex Burkhead, right? Shane Vereen. He has that type of skill set that if you go back 15 years, maybe he doesn't have a place in the NFL. But with the way offenses run now, a guy who can just get out and run routes like a, like a wide receiver, which he can, is valuable. And he's going to catch people by surprise a lot faster than people think. He's a lot sturdier than people think. Um, and I, I would not be surprised at all if you see the Saints drafting in the fifth or sixth round. You have three fifth-round picks. If you make all three of those, I would I would expect Dylan to be one of those. I talked to him after at the Senior Bowl, rather, and you know I asked him who his game reminded, who he would comp himself to, and he said Christian McCaffrey, which was funny. And I know I've said this before, but it was funny because Luke McCaffrey was standing about 15 feet away from us, Christian's brother. He's a wide receiver for Rice, and he was also the senior bowl. And I asked him if he had run his Christian McCaffrey comp past Luke, and he said no, <laughs> because he didn't want to didn't want to have that conversation. I did tell him that I saw him more as a Danny Woodhead, and he he lit up. He was like, thank you. You know, like he appreciates that comp because that's the type of player he is, and that's what he wants to be in the NFL. So I'm interested. If the Saints can bring him in uh, in the fifth, sixth round, I think whoever drafts this guy is going to – he's going to contribute for them at some point in the near future. Maybe not as a rookie. Uh, maybe maybe he ends up on a practice squad somewhere, but I really do like his game. All right, but that is it. That is the list. So we talked about Olu Fashana. We talked to Talia Sifuanga. The only other player that got multiple selections – in my mock draft roundup, which keep in mind, it did include, it was 40 mock drafts. It did include mine and Steve's from the other day, which was a little misconstrued because you know, I didn't want to go with an old mock draft, but this most recent one was trades, right? So Joe Alt, the only pick he got in the mock draft uh, from for the Saints was from Steve's mock because he traded up to nine to get him. Tyler Guyton, he was picked once. That was in my mock because I traded down 
to get him. There was one other offensive tackle. And Marius Mims was another guy who someone put a trade in. I think they had him trading down to 22 with the Eagles. And they took a Marius Mims. So I think that's kind of what you're looking at is there are tiers of offensive tackle prospects. If you get one of these top three, four guys, you feel like you're there. If you want to trade down and get one of these second tier first round guys, you can do that, but you're looking at a Tyler Guy and a Marius Mims, someone who might not be ready to start right away. Only a, only one defensive player was picked more than once, and it was Jared Verse, defensive end, Florida State. The other picks, Brian Thomas Jr., Brock Bowers, Jerzon Newton, and J.C. Latham was another offensive tackle who got a pick. So, you know, I think it's going to be really tough to sell people on a skill position player when week three in the season, Derek Carr can't keep his feet getting knocked on his ass and you're like well but we really wanted to get him brock bowers though um so i think they're i think the mock drafts are on to something and uh and we'll see you know the saints love doing something that's going to make people say what who is that guy so uh, i'll never put it past them but i think i think that gives you a good idea a lot of these names of the people you brought in who could be one of these one a lot of these names i know the saints have nine draft picks i've said previously i would bet money that they do not make nine picks. <laughs> I would bet folding money that they do not make nine picks. Whether they make six, whether they make five, whether they make eight, uh, I think there's going to be some movement. And uh, it's just a question of who they're targeting to go get it. But all right, let's wrap up that segment. Again, I'm Jeff Nowak. This is Inside Black and Gold, our first live stream in a while. So I wanted to devote two segments to a mailbag. So I know we have a good number of comments in there right now. I'm going to go to break. I'm going to go through those. If you have any hot takes, any, anything you want to talk about, throw it in there and we'll get through as many as possible. Who dat? We'll be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. Thanks for hanging in through that that extended break. There was a good number of comments in there. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss them, but I've got a bunch starred up there. There should be enough. If you have other questions, comments, throw them in there, and I'll go through them again, what I haven't gone through yet prior to the final segment, and uh, and we'll see how many how many we can get through. But the first one, first one I I did need to I did need to throw up was Scout without clout. 
always got comments. He says, I don't see it with Lobby. Reminds me, oh, Lobby. Lobby. I, I need to figure out how to say his name. I keep saying Lobby. I think it's like Lobby or whatever. I need to watch more UNH highlights. But he says, it reminds me of Max Borgie, which uh, that's that's a new one for me. You know, these it's a, it's a dart throw, right? You know, you're looking at a guy who you see traits with that you feel like you can develop and work with. And I do think that in the Clint Kubiak offense, you do want guys who are versatile and you want more guys who are versatile. And I think he just does that for me. And, and part of it is I just, you know, he's a UNH guy. I like seeing these smaller school guys do well and get, get a chance. I think in most cases, that's what the senior bowl is about, right? You get some of the top end prospects, but a lot, the much bigger aspect of it is you put these smaller school guys on a field with bigger school guys, you know, maybe not the top end first round guys, but you got Ohio State, you got Alabama, right? You got you got LSU guys out there, and you get to see these players compete. And that's what stood out to me is you you watch these guys play on the same field at the same level, actually compete with each other, which is something that doesn't happen at the combine or a pro day. And you're like, it, it, it's just an opportunity to be sit back and kind of say, okay, you know, that guy looks like he belongs here. That guy maybe not, but this guy does. And that's kind of how I came away from it with Lobby. So. Take it for what it is. I just, when I saw the way he played and the, and what he was able to do, he stood out to me immediately. And so you see him get a visit with the Saints. And I think that's uh, that's a good indicator that they saw the same thing. Either way, I appreciate it. Um, there's a lot in here. And 992 RAS is for a late round wide receiver. I really like Brendan Rice. I don't have a ton of insight on Brendan Rice, but I'll let that stand. If you have Brendan Rice takes, throw them in the throw them in the chat and we can talk about them. Um, Pelicans Nola here says, if we don't pick the best player available, that's how we ended up with Marcus Davenport, Peyton Turner, and Trevor Penning. All of them are reaches. See, I I I disagree with that. Um because you know, if you're if you're going if you're not going best player available, you are typically just going with what the board tells you. And so when you have, when you trade up to whatever it was, 18, 15 for Marcus Davenport, that's not going best player available. That's going to get the guy you want on the board. It, going best player available is typically going to be you sit in your draft slot and you let the board come to you and whoever is the best player at whatever position you're looking at it. Now, you know, when when I talked to Matt Miller from ESPN, I asked him how he felt about that. And he kind of agrees. It's like best player available is kind of a myth because um, most teams, every team will say, hey, we're going to draft the best player available. But in most in most, if not all cases, you're really talking about we're going to take a, the best player available at one of these two, three positions. Right. Because because need does have to factor in. It just does. You know, you, you you're kidding yourself if you don't think that the Saints are looking at this draft the same way as everybody else saying there's a lot of tackles in there. <laughs> there's a lot of tackles. Uh, and, and and you look at your roster, and you're like, we don't have a lot of tackles. Um, and the ones we do are breaking. So, uh, I mean, it's it's tough because, yeah, what well, Brock Bowers is probably the best player available when you talk about if he gets to 14. When you talk about the scouting, when you talk about, you know, the profile, the grade you have on him, I'm sure he's at the top of their list. But I just find it really, really difficult to to do that. And, and, and you know, I wouldn't complain, right? Like when, when the Giants signed Saquon Barkley or when the Giants drafted Saquon Barkley at number two, I think most Giants fans would be like, yeah, that was kind of dumb. They shouldn't have done that. But at the same time, everyone – was excited. Everyone was, you were buying a Saquon jersey and, and he lived up to the hype. They sucked. He lived up to the hype. They sucked as a team. And and that's not what you want to be. That's not where you want to be as a team. But at the same time, I think there is some value in getting the fans excited. And you know, the probably the only guy the Saints could pick in the first round that would legitimately have people lining up to go watch is Brock Bowers. So I don't know. Take take that with a grain of salt. Do with that what you will. If their goal is to get people excited, then Brock is the guy. Um, but again, it's <laughs> it's really tough. You know, like I, I, again, I think BPA is is a myth to some extent, and you'd be crazy to not try to fill fill your void. In my opinion, at right tackle in this first round, not necessarily at left tackle. 
you can get draft a guy who could play either position. It's you, you kind of you don't want to pigeonhole them into saying, hey, this guy is definitely a right tackle. This guy's definitely a left tackle. If you can project to move, you can play both sides. But I just I find it really tough to see them getting out of this draft out of tackle. Uh, either way, I appreciate uh, appreciate the comment. And there's Justin Pesquale. He's saying the same thing, right? VPA at a position of need. Um, and, you know, I, you can make the argument that the Saints need a tight end. Like, uh, genuinely. Like, we talk about Jawan Johnson. I do like Jawan Johnson. I think that what you saw last year was maybe not the best reflection of what he should be able to do over the course of a season. You still have a, a, a former UDFA that you converted from wide receiver as your star tight end. And that's not, you know, even, like Adam Trout was a third round pick. If you if you threw a third round pick at a tight end last year, you could have ended up with, uh, you know, Luke Musgrave. I think he might have gone late second round. Or you could have ended up with a Tyler Croft. You could have ended up with a guy who had kind of elite traits, who had a top 75 grade at tight end on your roster that you're that you're developing over time. Saints didn't do that. Saints avoided the tight end position entirely, which annoyed the hell out of me. But, you know, it's it also shows that they are not going to make their draft board based on, hey, all of these players at this really deep position are there. We got to go get one because if it was, they would have gone and got it last year. I, but I do want to see them add talent to that tight end room. And uh, maybe that is what they do. Pelicans Nola says, Mickey Loomis, you have to give the Houdat Nation something to get excited for with the number 14 pick. You know, and again, that goes back to, hey, if you, if you want to get someone excited, like I. I'd love to hear anyone else's suggestion of who they could draft that would legitimately kind of uh, electrify the fan base in a way that you haven't seen from a draft pick in the last several years. And I don't, I can't think of anyone other than that. I mean, obviously if you traded up and went and got one of these top quarterbacks, um, maybe if they took a Michael Penix, then you could say, Hey, there's some excitement there. But I do think that Brock is probably the only guy. If, if that's your goal, let's see. Die 92 RAS again. Saints need to draft the best O-lineman they can with at least two picks. I don't hate that. I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, if they went offensive tackle at 14 and 45, I don't think anyone would be like, ah, oh, they're crazy. Why would they do that? But but we'll see. Uh, if the best player is left tackle or right tackle, you got to take them. Agree. Scout without clout says, I hope it's JC Latham, right tackle Alabama. And if you're still here, I'd, you know, if you want to expand upon that, you know, I think that there's, it, it's tough because there's so many, I think you're looking at seven or eight first round tackle prospects. You know, in my mock draft, I got the eighth one when I traded back to 24 and that was Tyler Guyton. He's a fringe first round pick, but I do think he's a first round pick. But yeah, I mean, it, you, you could rank these guys any way you want. It's going to be different from team to team. It's going to be different from offense to offense. One offense needs your tackle to pull a lot more than the other. You need a bit more athletic profile. One one is really interested in pass pro. So Fashanu is the guy that you're like, that's your gold standard. It's it's tough. JC Latham is kind of in the middle for me. I, I have a hard time gauging it. And it's always difficult for me to gauge Alabama offensive line talent because he's going to be surrounded by top end offensive line talent. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of like an Ohio state player on offense It's like, I don't know exactly how to gauge Marvin Harrison jr. Just because there's so much talent around him that does it make his life easier. Like, is he going to be a guy when he is the focal point of an NFL offense going to be able to stand out the way that he did in college? Same, same for an offensive lineman it's kind of the inverse of the small school problem. Like you watch Trevor Penning beat up on, you know, these like 240 pound defensive ends, not even 215 pound defensive ends at uh, Northern Iowa. And you're like, okay, but is he good enough to project to the NFL level? And is his technique a big enough issue that it's going to take him multiple years to develop? And I think you've found out the answer to that, but it's kind of the opposite with Alabama because <laughs> they're just bullying people all the time. That's interesting. All right. Scout without clout. Rice is a good deep threat for teams that miss on Brian Thomas. They might like him. I think we already have two deep threats, though. We probably get a slot wide receiver or a prototypical X. You know, I, you know, Brian Thomas is interesting to me. I, I think Brian Thomas is a guy that the Saints, if they were 
drafting later in the first round would seriously consider. I think he does a lot of the things you need your wide receiver to do. Um, I apologize if the connection is bad currently. It just kind of started on me out of nowhere. Uh, let's make sure my phone isn't on Wi-Fi. It's usually a good trick. Um, I'm going to close out everything. But I kind of see Brian Thomas as a different kind of deep threat as a Rashid Shahid, a Chris Olave. And, and I think he can do a lot more over the middle of the field. I think his size is a bit more impressive. He's got kind of that long stride speed as opposed to kind of that quick twitch street speed that I would give to Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid. So I, I would honestly think Brian Thomas is a is if he was going in at if he was on the board at 45, he'd be really intriguing to me. I don't think he will be. Um, but you know, I, I don't know if you can ever have too many deep threats. I don't think you're gonna look at the wide receiver position and say, ah, we already got guys who can go downfield. We don't need to get another guy who can do that. It's more about can they run the whole route tree? I'd also like to see you get a little more unpredictable with how you use Rashid Shahid. So if you have another guy who can take on that role and you can shift Rashid into the slot and let him run more over the middle of the field and get involved in the screen game. And again, use that punt returner ability in space with some uh, yards after catch. I would love to see it right now. I just don't think you have the personnel to do that. And so uh, however you add a guy, I wouldn't hate um, kind of some redundancy there. All right. Mitchell Milano says he enjoyed the wood is insane. Major pause, which uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to be mad at it. Here's another one from Scout without clout. Braden Fisk, Marshawn Nealon, Tavondre Sweat see most realistic options in round two. All run stuffers. I, I I agree. I would. I think that this team became painfully aware in the 2022 season specifically that they had allowed the interior of the defense to um, disintegrate a little bit, to 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 turn into a weakness as opposed to a strength because they just hadn't drafted the position the way you you had in the past, right? The way you, you look at guys in the second, third round, David Onyemata, right? The, they took a Sheldon Rankins at number 12 overall. It was a priority for this team. And then they kind of let it they let it fester. And, and suddenly you're looking at David Onyemata and Shai Tuttle, an older David Onyemata, and they're just not getting the job done. And so you spent a first round pick on Brian Bazee last year. I think that went a long way toward rebuilding that. But, you know, at 45, I wouldn't be surprised if you end up with Tavondre Sweat or Braden Fisk or, you know, Marshawn Nealon would be a DN prospect. But, uh, you know, you're still addressing the pass rush or the run defense in some way. And I just think this team understands that if they don't sort out the defensive line, they're not going to go very far. And this defense is going to is just going to kind of corrode around everybody. So I, I agree. I think. Like there's a reason Steve and I both took Braden Fisk in our last mock, and it's because he just does the things that I think this team, this team likes. But all right, let's wrap up this segment of Inside Black and Gold. This is our first live mailbag segment. We are going to come back with another segment to answer more questions. I know there's more comments in there, so it's going to be another longer break as I kind of star these. But if you have any more comments, make sure to throw them in. And otherwise, we will be right back.
And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm going to apologize in advance. My connection just decided to start sucking, and this doesn't seem to want to come back. So if there's some freezing going on, I had done a good job. We've we'd been a we'd gone a long time in between, you know, awkward, laggy live streams or videos. But hey, you know, we're back here again. So uh, <laughs> apologies in advance, but we'll we'll get into it. Um, question we had here that kind of goes back to uh, last segment. Let me find it. Justin Pasquale says, would you rather have Leggett or Coleman in the second round if the Saints went that path? Both seem to like they have ability to replace Mike Thomas. You know, Xavier Leggett was a guy I took at 45 in our second mock draft. And if he had been there, I might have taken him again in our most recent one. Obvious, I don't think he was. I think he went a pick or two earlier than that. So, I mean, just in terms of I've gotten a much closer look at Xavier Leggett to kind of understand what what I'm, you know, what I'm looking at um that's probably who i would i would air toward you know keon coleman i think the saints have gotten a really good look at him obviously they had him in for a visit i don't think he'll be there i think the get has a guy that that might fall down from from where his peak draft stock would be whereas i think coleman's gonna see that stock rise and and in part because you know when you're on that prolific of an offense it, it helps you out you know south carolina for for better or worse was not a very good team and uh, it, it's not going to show Xavier well. Um, that said, I think you, I don't think you could go wrong with either of those guys. Xavier has that, uh, that, that, that sweet South Carolina accent that, uh, that I love, but you know, I'd, I'd probably go with Leggett just cause this, I think the size is, is more legit. Like, like Keon's a bigger guy, but you put him next to a lot of wide receivers and you'd be like, okay, that's a wide receiver. Xavier, you know, he's built like a, built like a truck. And that's kind of what I need. And because that's always, you know, what Mike Thomas was best at was just being more physical than anybody else. Um, and uh, and we'll see. But either way, I, I, I don't hate either of those picks. If they went with either of those guys at 45 and you could make a significant argument that they do need to add wide receiver talent to 45, I'd be OK with it. But I would land uh, I would land on Leggett. Uh, Scout Without Cloud says, one question from what you've seen slash heard of Sal very heard of Sal very Can he win the starting left guard spot? Can he? Yes. Will he? I think that's a big ask. Um, and it's just because you didn't see him on the field at all last year. And it's not his fault. You know, James Hurst was healthy all season, right? So you didn't really need to get depth, get that deep in the weeds at the at the guard spot the way you had to at, at tackle. Um, I think you need to see him compete for that job in camp. We talked about this in a previous episode. And I do think that this team is, you know, they, they're not down on, on Nick, right? They drafted him kind of knowing that they were going to have him focus on guard. You know, he played tackle in college and he had, and he played multiple offensive line spots, but he was primarily a tackle in college. And they knew that they were going to have to take a little time and focus him on guard and have him pick up the skills that he maybe was able to bypass in college because he was at Old Dominion and the talent level he was blocking was not as high. Um, so I think it's just a question, and that's what this team is going to look at, is how far along is he? Does he pick up the skills that they need him to pick up? Can he polish the the areas that he struggled? And if he can do that, then yes, because I, you know, I, I don't think James Hurst is a particularly um, impressive starting left guard. I think he's probably below replacement level at left guard. And the reason he's on the team is versatility and the fact that he's a good locker room guy. So you could you could beat that guy out. Um, <laughs> you know, James Hurst is a guy who was a backup most of his career. He probably should still be a backup now. A high-quality backup, but a backup nonetheless. So, you know, I think they're going to give him a chance. I think Nick's going to have a chance to compete. Um, even if he doesn't win that job out of camp, I think he ends up being kind of your, your first-in-line backup, the way Landon Young has kind of developed into that first-in-line backup. And then if you do have an injury at guard, then yes, I think he could take over that job and probably own it. But I think that's that's the process that you'll go with is you'll start with the veteran, and then if the younger player takes over and plays better, then you stick with him. But uh, for now, I I think it's just you got to see what what he has in camp, and uh, and go from there. Mitchell Milano says Penning can develop. I have no idea why we are acting as if his career has been decided. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Now, there's good reason to be skeptical of a guy who was not able to get on the field in year two. If the Saints had not fired Doug Marone, I would say I would be much more heavily in the, okay, you got to just find another option because this ain't it. The fact that they fired the offensive line coach tells you a lot about how they felt that room was being handled and particularly the development of young players, in my opinion. So I do think that they're hopeful that John Benton gets in there and this new staff gets in there and they're able to wring a much more productive season out of Trevor Penning. I think you're going to let him play through his struggles this year more so than last year, assuming he wins that job out of camp. And you're hopeful that, you know, like, and this is not just to say this, he was dealing with a torn Liz Frank tendon last year, Liz Frank, whatever, and had to have surgery. So he lost that entire off season that, that, and that, you know, you talk about a leap from year one to year two, that comes through playing, but it also comes from having a full NFL offseason that's not interrupted by pro days, that's not interrupted by a draft, that's not interrupted by moving your entire life from Iowa to New Orleans. You know, you just get to focus on football for the first time and focus on getting better and, and fixing issues. And, you know, the players that improve are the ones that do that, right? The players that show up in year two and look a lot better are the ones that spend a lot of time in the offseason. Uh, working on the things that they were unable to work on prior to their rookie season. Trevor couldn't do that. And he got into camp and he just looked like the same guy because he was the same guy. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's that's what this team is. That's the half, the glass half full take on Trevor Penning is he has all off season with a healthy foot <laughs> and hopefully he can get some private coaching. He can get to where he needs to be and uh, keep Derek Carr alive this season in a way that he was unable to um, last year over the first several games. You, know, you talk about 11 sacks through through two and two and a half games. That's what Derek had. And they finished with, I think, 34 sacks allowed on the season. So you can kind of do the math there and say you, you're allowed 11 through your first, uh, you know, what, 10 quarters, 10 and a half quarters. And then you allowed 24 through your final however many games, 14 games. So it's clear that taking him out did help things along. Um, and uh, I don't know. That's going to be the biggest the biggest issue I have is if if you can't, if you can't get it done, you can't force it, um, but we'll see. Either way, I, I agree in the sense that a lot of people have already heaped dirt on Trevor Penning as if this guy going into his third year just has no chance whatsoever of becoming a, a, a quality NFL player. And I just don't think that's that's necessarily true. Uh, Justin Pasquale says, also, we've got to go get Theo Johnson in the mid-round. Love his tape and what he can bring. You know, Theo's funny, and, and the tight end class is really funny this year. You know, uh, you know, Mike Dettelier talked about this uh, recently. You know, last year was probably, if not the best, one of the top five tight end classes of all time uh, in terms of the depth, right? You're talking about guys, you know, Sam Laporto, uh, you know, was the first guy off the board, I believe. And he was, you know, but then you had Theo Johnson, Luke, uh, not Theo Johnson, uh, Luke Musgrave, Tyler Croft, Dalton Kincaid, you know, Darnell Washington slipped. He was the last of that group to get picked. And even he, I think, was a third rounder. There was just so much talent at the tight end position. This year, um, it's it's Brock Bowers. It's Jatavian uh, Sims, no, uh, from, from Texas. People know what I'm talking about. He's probably the only other day two pick. And then you're talking about a lot of day three guys. You know, maybe maybe a team falls in love with Theo Johnson's traits and and takes him in the third round. But I think more likely you're just going to see several fourth, fifth, sixth round tight ends. And Theo's in that group. And uh, the reason I find Theo interesting is, you know, a team's going to fall in love with what he's able to do physically and probably overdraft him, probably – you know, if if he was projected to go in the fifth round, he'd go in the fourth round because there's so many things there to like that kind of fly in the face of the fact that there's really no tape to get excited about. The stats aren't there to get excited about. But, you know, he's big, he's athletic, he can block, he can go out and catch passes, he needs to work on his route running. Um, but for a fifth, sixth round tight end, I think I think that's value. So I, I agree. I wouldn't if they don't go Brock early on, I think you could see them target a guy like a Theo Johnson. There's, there's several other tight ends that they could, that they could look at. Um, 
even even like a Johnny Wilson from Florida State, you know, they they did love t- turning Juwan Johnson into a, into a tight end. Maybe they look at Johnny Wilson and he's six six whatever two thirty, and they take him with the idea of converting him to a tight end. So he's another guy you could look at. All right, going back to J.C. Latham, I asked Scout without clout why he would prefer J.C. Latham, and he says he's so big with elite balance, has monster man mauling reps in the run game. That's good alliteration with mobility that exceeds what should be possible at his size. Evan Neal bust might make Latham fall two fingers crossed. And there was somebody else that that pointed out, you know, I, I me go on this long rant about how Alabama just bullies people out the offensive line on the offensive line, but that really wasn't the case last year. And you, you, a, there's a good argument to be made that that roster was, was falling off. And maybe, maybe that's why Nick Saban decided to retire. He's going to blame NIL, but you know, that roster was not the, Loaded with talent roster, we have grown accustomed to seeing, at least not at the level of winning championships each and every year. Um, so, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe maybe I'm overreacting to kind of my uh, my feelings about Alabama always just bullying people. But I, I felt the same way about Clemson when they were winning all those titles. It's really just tough to gauge a team when there's that much talent. It's like, for example, the quarterback. Like, you look at Bryce Young, right? You're like, okay, how good is the quarterback when he's throwing to – you know, first round wide receivers every, every week. Right. And he has this top end offensive line, CJ Stroud. I think one of the reasons you look at him and say, Hey, why wasn't he a higher level prospect? Why didn't people like him as much? And I think that's part of it too, is because every year Ohio state has the top wide receiver. So is it the quarterback? Is it the wide receiver? You know, I do think it's, it's really interesting that there's three first round wide receivers in this draft, right? Or there's three top 10 wide receivers in this draft. There's several first round wide receivers, but you're talking about Roma Dunze. Michael Penix was a Heisman candidate. Is it, is it Roma Dunze? Who's, who's the star? Or is it Michael Penix or is it a combination? Uh, Malik neighbors, Jaden Daniels won the Heisman trophy. Is Malik neighbors really that good? Or is Jaden Daniels really that good? Or is it the combination? Uh, Marvin Harrison and uh, you know, whoever else, but the point is, you know, it can be that simple as as they're both really good. You look at Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow. I'm curious to see what Jamar Chase's career might have been like if he didn't land with Joe Burrow, but he did and they and they hit the ground running. So I don't know. I just I think as you kind of go through this, um, you do have to kind of weigh teams against individual talent that said you know i I think you're right i mean jc latham i I don't think you would go wrong with any of these offensive line prospects it's just a matter of picking the right one it's kind of like the wide receiver draft in 2022 where it was like chris olave garrett wilson drake london you couldn't go wrong with any of them they've all been really good and it's just a matter of okay who do you have rated the highest and you go get them and the saints i would argue came away with the top one even though they did not pick the top one i think garrett wilson and uh, Drake London both came off before Chris Olave was picked. So it'll go from there, but all right, let's, let's move on. Mitchell Milano says, also, we keep looking at this just as a position thing. Look at it beyond that. DA said he wants to play physical offense. That is not for Sean game. No. And, and I think, again, I think that you're overreacting to the kind of plug and play aspect that you can get out of Olu that maybe you wouldn't get out of some other guys, but I do, you know, this draft more than any, you know, we, I, every year we go into this and we evaluate and we say, well, this is what the saints have done previously. And this is what they've targeted. And until we see a couple drafts with the Clint Kubiak system in play, it's going to be tough to know how that changes, right? What do you prioritize differently than you did in the past? And, you know, do you, do you prioritize, you know, athletic tight ends, <laughs> right? Is that something that you look at this offense as Clint Kubiak and you say, I think we need a higher pedigree tight end to grease the skids on a lot of these concepts. And if that's the case, then maybe you do go for a Brock Bowers or, you know, you, you want a more mauling uh, offensive line. And so you, you wouldn't look at Fashanu for that. So I do think there's a, there's a good point to be made there. And DA did kind of surreptitiously kind of throw in, uh, Hey, you know, all these pass catchers, you know, if you, uh, there's only one way to interpret that, and it's that he's including wide tight ends in that because there's, you know, uh, you could say receiving running backs. But I think if you're not saying wide receivers and you're saying pass catchers, 
it means you're talking about the tight end position. All right, let's see a few more. H-Town Creole. Saints should get the best player available because the team is in rebuild denial. Will Campbell and Jones are leaving LSU next season. Rebuild denial. That's a good one. I haven't heard that before. Rebuild denial. What stage of grief is rebuild denial? Is that the third or fourth stage? Um, but no, I, I mean, I land on, on this differently every time I think about it. And like, what is a rebuild? And what are you looking for to rebuild for you not to deny it? Right? Like what, what are the saints doing that says we're not, we're not trying to get younger on the roster. And I don't know. I kind of feel like they are. I kind of feel like that is what they're showing you by not getting aggressive in free agency, letting David Onyemata, David Onyemata walk last year, right? Drafting a, a first round defensive tackle and signing a couple younger defensive tackles in Colin Saunders, Nathan Shepard, right? You're talking about a team that everyone's like, Hey, what if, why are they thinking about trading Marshawn Lattimore? I mean, that's to me, that's a soft rebuild. And, you know, I think the, the, when you talk about rebuild denial, it's not about just a static rebuild of like, hey, we're not good enough here. We're probably not a title contender right now, so we don't want to act like one. And we want to be a little bit more judicious about how we dole out free agency dollars, you know, how we spend our assets in the draft, you know, how we how we evaluate younger players versus veterans who, you know, maybe you have to play to learn versus have a little higher floor at this point, but they could reach their ceiling with playing time. And, and I do think the saints are there. Um, the issue is I don't think any, there's a lot of people who probably wouldn't accept that as a rebuild because their definition of rebuild is tear everything down to the studs and literally just start fresh with, with rookies and second year players and third year players. And see, I don't, I, I don't like that. I don't want to see the team do that. So I'm never going to say, Hey, they should. Cause I just don't think that's, you know, I've watched teams do that. I've watched teams be bad. I've watched teams be bad, not, you don't want to say intentionally, but they've set up situations where they're probably going to be bad and they succeed at being bad. And I, I don't know, as a fan of a team, you don't want to be watching your team do that, right? Like we talk about getting this team, getting the fan base excited. No one's getting excited for this team to lose 15 games. You know, maybe you go get a quarterback. Maybe you don't. Maybe you draft Bryce Young. Maybe you get a quarterback that is a bust because this team has never shown the ability to go draft a quarterback. <laughs> like, so I don't know. I, I, I think you could, you could go about it in a variety of ways, but I mean, Will Campbell and, and, and Jones, I, <laughs> uh, there's one thing I know about the saints. It is that I should never get too excited about LSU players in the draft. Even even now that they're willing to take some LSU players with Foster Moreau, Tyron Matthew, I still don't think they're going to draft draft guys just because they're uh, they're uh, close by. Scout without clout. We get one more, one or two more in here. It says if we simply draft offensive tackle well this year, defensive defensive end well next year, and QB year after, we could be back in contention. I think it's too early to say whether whether our rebuild is going well or poorly yet. Yeah, it, right. I, I agree with that. I do think they are trying to soft rebuild. Now, the success at which you do it is another question. Um, but I, I, I agree. I think this is a year where playoffs would be a victory. And I think you can get to the playoffs if you if things break your way in a way they haven't in the past. And, and if Derek Carr is more comfortable and if you can build out the offensive line uh, in front of him in a way that is helpful. Um, but I do think they are in a rebuild. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like when you're looking at the the economy and you're like, are we in a recession? Some I, I'm poor, but is everyone else poor? Are we technically in a recession, or is it just like you know everyone's gas prices are really high and I I have to buy Wonder Bread instead of the other bread? I, I don't know. That's kind of what it is with a rebuild. Like, I wish there was like a like a like a governing entity that could be like rebuild <laughs> so that we could all just stop debating about whether it's happening or not. Uh, so here, here's one, here's one we can close on. Cause I disagree with it. Roderick Dewey says uh, you can't truly rebuild with an aging quarterback. And it, I don't know. I kind of feel like the opposite. 
I feel like you can't really rebuild unless you have an aging quarterback because otherwise you're just screwing over a kid, right? Like it's really difficult to rebuild around a rookie quarterback. Like look at what the Panthers are doing. The Panthers, like you could, the Texans got really lucky with how they were able to pull their situation off. But one of the reasons it worked as well as it did is that rebuild started two years before they drafted their rookie quarterback, right? So they had pieces in place and Davis Mills was the sacrificial lamb or whoever else was there was the sacrificial lamb. By the time CJ Stroud stood behind that offensive line, it was a really good offensive line. By the time he was throwing to his receivers, you had quality receivers there for him to throw to. You know, they had a they had a, not a great defense, but a good defense. Obviously, they had the rookie head coach. And the only way you get there is by going with a veteran quarterback. Um, <laughs> so, so I would argue that you are actually in a very good space to rebuild now if you continue to do that. Whereas if you go draft Jaden Daniels, the commanders say the commanders draft Jaden Daniels, that team's not ready to win. So you are committing your franchise quarterback to one, two, three seasons of just relentless misery. And that's tough to build around. And by the time you build up your roster again, have you stunted your quarterback's growth? And he's never going to be a guy that can get you more than seven, eight wins. And at that point, you're stuck in the middle. So I don't know. I like. I think you're talking about Derek Carr and you're saying if they were trying to rebuild, they wouldn't have Derek Carr right now. And I disagree with that. I think you very much can rebuild with Derek Carr, but you have to be willing to draft a quarterback behind him and develop a quarterback behind him. And that's what I'm not sure the Saints are willing to do at this point. It, I mean, maybe they are. If they go and take Michael Penix in the second round, maybe that's their signal to you. If they don't, then it becomes tougher. And you're looking at Jay Kaner and being like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't think so. But um, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> Roderick, Roderick says, it works for Peyton Manning. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> it works for Peyton Manning. But I don't think that you're going to get very far if you if you base all of your NFL takes around like, oh, if you just take Peyton Manning, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think the Saints would be happy if they could find a way to draft Peyton Manning. Then it'd be good. But no, and you're right in the sense that Peyton really struggled in his rookie year. You know, he had one of the worst rookie years of any quarterback you'll find, or at least any quarterback that ended up starting for ten plus years. But he is the exception, uh, not the not the rule. And one more. The only way you keep an aging QB is only if you start invest. Yeah, if you start to invest in a new one. Like, uh, we're on the same page here. Right. So if, if you're someone who really wants the Saints to rebuild, the answer is not cut Derek Carr and, and, and commit to losing. The answer is bring in a quarterback that ideally could start in, in two years. Right. Look at you go the. Uh, for example, like look at the teams that have been successful at replacing veteran quarterbacks with young quarterbacks. What have they done? Draft Pat Mahomes and let him sit behind Alex Smith for a couple of years. Those chief teams made the playoffs. They're, they weren't good enough to win in the playoffs, but they made the playoffs. Those were good teams. So you rebuilt around Alex Smith and allowed Pat Mahomes to get better. And when Pat Mahomes showed up, he obviously was already ready to win. And then, you know, I've Obviously, if everyone could draft Pat Mahomes, you'd be great. Jordan Love, another example. Aaron Rodgers, another example. When you can do that, you have a much better chance to execute a rebuild. Um, so, so we'll see. But I think uh, we'll end with Justin Pasquale. If the Saints nail this draft, how many wins do you see them getting this year? So it's a good question. Um, it, by nailed it, you know, I, I'd probably use the 2017 draft as kind of the standard bearer for a team nailing a draft. And so with that, you would say, you know, at least two starters and then a third player who is making a big impact behind a starter. So in that case, it would have been in the, in the 2017, you actually got three starters and then that other guy, cause you got Marshawn Lattimore, Ryan Ramchek, Alvin Kamara and Marcus Williams. Um, so, you know, if, if the Saints were able to pull three starters out of this draft, which would be nearly impossible because, you know, they, they only have two picks in the top four, in the top 150. Um, 
let's say two starters. Let's say they 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 get two starters and kind of that that depth guy, which you know, 14, 45, and then you trade up to three and you get a guy and you hit on. Uh, in that case, you, you draft a you draft a right tackle and he comes in and he plays right away. Trevor Penning develops and is a quality left tackle at 45. You take uh, I don't know, say Keon Coleman, and he comes in, and he catches 40 passes, five touchdowns, and he has a really solid impact as a rookie on defense. You know, Brian Brzee takes a step forward. You trade Marshawn Lattimore and you put Alante Taylor outside, and he really and he really thrives there. Or you keep Marshawn Lattimore and Alante Taylor stays in the slot. It improves if if you know Jordan Howden, Jonathan Abram, kind of and, and Tyron Matthew kind of bridge that that veteran to rookie to young player safety group, and they play effectively. If the kicking game, the punting game, if everything went perfectly, I think this team's ceiling is twelve wins. And again, that's if everything goes perfectly. No major injuries at positions you can't replace, you know, no, no double doinks in London, you know, stuff like that stuff that, you know, those, those, those games that could go either way, go against you, no balls, net dro- no drops in the end zone for a game tying touchdown, stuff like that. Like if all of that stuff goes your way, I think you're looking at a 12 win team. Now, somewhere in the middle of that is reality. And that's why, you know, the seven and a half, we, we can talk about that for a second. The seven and a half over under, a lot of it is sentiment. It's not necessarily analysis. Um, and I think you're you're looking at a team that will be pushing to be in the same area it was last year. And that's what's frustrating is, is I don't see a route to getting much better. That said, last year's team probably should have won 10 games. And if those breaks go your way this year, the way they did in last year, say in Green Bay, say against the Jaguars, right? Um, then I think you're probably hoping to get back to nine and 10 wins. If things go terribly, you, 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 you flub on the draft, Trevor Penning camp can't hack it at left tackle. Your right tackle is a rookie who, even if he's playing well, is still a rookie who's struggling. Derek Carr's getting, getting rocked every time he drops back. Alvin Kamara shows his age. Kendra Miller gets hurt again. All this stuff goes against you. You're probably looking at a, at a four win team. And, you know, I was joking with Steve about this. It's like, he was like, man, people will be so pissed if that happens. And I'm, and I, and I can't help but feel like, yes, people will be annoyed throughout the course of a four win season, but then there'll be a lot of people who'll be like, yeah, but that's, that's the type of season that would get the coach fired. And if you are of the, of the people that wants to see that happen, then you probably won't be mad. So I don't know. It's uh, I do think that that's kind of the, the ring you kind of sit in of, okay, are you going to stay mired in this mediocrity where you show no signs of improvement, get another nine win season, miss the playoffs on a tiebreaker, or are you just going to kind of bite the bullet and be bad? Um, and I think this season, it, it could go either way because there's this, you, you need depth and you need a shield from being that terrible team. And that's what's kind of gone away for the Saints over the last two years is, is that that shield that's kept you from that, that five, four or five win season which you have not had since 2005. That's thinner and thinner and thinner by the day. And eventually you're going to break through that and it's just going to all fall off a cliff. I don't know if they're there right now, but they're getting close. And uh, and that's where I'll end it. On that super positive note, again, I'm Jeff Nowak. This is Inside Black and Gold. Thanks everyone for hanging out. I know it's kind of a weird time, but I did want to get a live stream at you. And I think We got it. We got it done. Thanks, everyone who hung around, everyone who dropped in a comment. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. Ring the bell on YouTube. Um, You know, we're we're, we've been we've been kind of all over the map with episodes. So hopefully we can get on a little bit better of a rhythm as we get into the draft, which is going to throw everything out of whack again. But but hey, that's the that's the world we live in. Who dat? Go Saints. Peace, y'all. Be easy.